Amen. Thank you. Our next scripture lesson comes from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star as at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler." who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star, that they, had been, that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. One of the things that happens when you start digging into Scripture is that you see bits of yourself in it, the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly. That is, it's not just that we read Scripture, it's that Scripture also reads us. And so how does today's passage read us? What does this passage say about us? Well, let's begin by looking at the Magi, also called wise men. Who were they? We know that they were outsiders. We don't know where they were from exactly, but it's clear that they were on the outside of every preferred category, geographically, religiously, ethnically, socially, politically. Pick a category, whatever one you choose. Matthew makes it clear that they didn't fit in, quote, the right category in any way, shape, or form. They didn't belong. Geographically, they were from the east. They were from far away from the center stage of God's activity in the Bible. Religiously, their practices would have been anathema to God's people, probably some combination of, on the one hand, what we know today of as astronomy, that is the scientific study of stars and their movements, but also, on the other hand, astrology, that more questionable interpretation of those movements and how they somehow direct our lives. The point is this. The Magi's geographical region and their religion couldn't have been farther away from the Israelites. And yet, somehow, God invites them in. God leads them in from far away without any initial help from God's people using a star of all things. And so this leads us to the first way that this passage reads us. It asks some probing questions of us. Have we excluded those that we consider to be outsiders? Scripture tells us that we human beings are fearfully and wonderfully made. For all our similarities, we are different in so many ways, right down to our DNA, 
and that we come in all kinds of shades and shapes and sizes all across the spectrum. And so the question this passage asks us again is, in what ways do we exclude people either intentionally or unintentionally? How might God be at work drawing in those that we would rather keep far off? And what Matthew is making clear here is that God's embrace reaches far beyond our comfort zones and personal preferences. As people of a God like that, our embrace also ought to be always stretching outside of our comfort zones and preferred categories, socially, politically, religiously, and so on. And the question that this passage also asks us beyond that is what star are you following? What in your life is leading you to a particular goal or destination? At the beginning of this new year, that often comes in the form of New Year's resolutions. Many of us have them, annual goals, personally and professionally, but beyond and even above those, what is your guiding star? What is it in your heart and mind internally? What guides and leads all those resolutions, big and small? Now, these are some questions that Matthew asks us as he tells us this story of the Magi. And so to help us answer this, let's look a little more closely at the Magi those magi that found Jesus simply by following a star. What's going on there? Well, some say that this is a good example of God leading people to worship God through nature. There may be something there. How many of us have had a transcendent experience while witnessing the awesomeness and the beauty of nature? Some part of God's creation, whether in the mountains or oceans, canyons, or the brilliant night sky far away from artificial light. Words fail to do justice to what we experience in those kinds of settings. And so perhaps that sense of awe and wonder connected with something deep in the heart of the Magi. Some longing to connect with something greater than themselves and then to be guided by that which they have connected to and experienced. Maybe that is what this star stirred in the Magi. And maybe you can relate to that kind of experience as well. Now, researchers have gone to great lengths to try to uncover the scientific phenomena of that particular star. I'm sure that there are no shortage of TV shows and magazines promising to finally uncover this ancient mystery. My take is that that is, in a sense, besides the point. What Matthew focuses on here is not the physical phenomenon of a moving and leading star, but rather how the Magi, following a combination of what they observed, what they discerned, what they believed, in their hearts to be true, how they then found themselves led to Jerusalem, inquiring of the Jewish authorities where this new king could be found so that they could then worship him. In other words, nature drew them to Jerusalem. What they found in Jerusalem was scripture, which pinpointed where they might find what they were looking for, which was precisely Jerusalem. Uh, Bethlehem. Now, throughout history, there has been a long-standing tradition of two books of God, the book of nature and the book of Scripture, each with their own purpose and place. Nature is meant to draw us in to praising God. Nature even participates in praising its creator. Scripture gives us words, gives us clarity, gives us direction for that praise. It enlightens the way that we are meant to inhabit God's creation. In Jerusalem, the Magi seek out the leading experts in Scripture and are there led to the newborn king by Scripture's light. John Calvin has a helpful 
image for that interplay between nature and Scripture, what he says is that when seen through the lens of Scripture, all of creation is a theater for God's glory. I'll say that again. When seen through the lens of Scripture, all of creation is a theater for God's glory. Scripture provides focus and clarity to that deep sense of awe and wonder we feel in experiencing the magnificence of God's creation. And our deep longings and experiences, our deep yearnings for all kinds of things in life are given a direction, are pointed toward a goal in Scripture, just as those of the Magi were. And if we follow what we find there, we too will be led to Christ and experience a deep and overwhelming joy. We read in Ecclesiastes that God has set eternity on our hearts. Augustine calls this a restlessness that each of us feel, which can only finally find its rest in God. George Herbert calls this restlessness a kind of pulley by which God draws us toward himself. And I think that is what the Magi are following. That is what pulls and leads each of us as well. I think that is what we most deeply long for, what that star represents. Something, sometimes it's represented in a person, sometimes a possession or a goal. Sometimes it's tied to the pursuit of a, an achievement or an accolade. Our deepest hopes and longings deep down, we imagine that if we reach or obtain these things, or if we can keep somehow from losing them, or having lost them, if we can regain them again, we imagine that if we can do this, that we will find happiness, that we will achieve joy. Scripture tells us something different. The joy witnessed to in Scripture is, scripture is of a different order altogether. It's not attached to external circumstances it's not contingent on successes or failures. It's not the product of power or possessions. It's not something that can be achieved or attained. Joy, when the Bible talks about it, is a state of mind and heart. It is always something attached to the one who is its source and object. God is both the giver and the object of joy. Personal joy, communal joy, both find their source and destination in God. God's words of promise and hope, for example, in the midst of a deep longing and waiting elicits joy in Scripture. The birth of Jesus is marked by joy. Encounters with Jesus throughout the Gospels are marked by joy. The crowds rejoice at the marvelous deeds and wonders Jesus performs. Meals with Jesus are marked and categorized by joy. As the early church is filled with the Holy Spirit, it is filled with joy. Joy is the result of Jesus doing the work of his Father, and that same joy is ours as we abide in him and are about that same work as Jesus. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit a healthy and nourishing sign that God is near and at work among us. And so here's a question. When was the last time you found yourself overwhelmed with joy? If we follow the Magi's lead here, well then the good news is that joy is freely available to each of us every week right here as we gather to worship the King of Kings. Have you ever felt joy wash over you in worship? It's certainly one of the things that brings me back again and again that no matter how hard or difficult life is at any particular moment, that God leads me still to joy in the midst of that in worship. Whatever burdens we bring, whatever longings or losses we carry, whatever celebrations or lamentations, they can be covered with joy in the act of worship. Whether in song or in 
prayer, whether in sermons or in silence, God means to take what we bring with us and to transform it all by us bringing it to our Savior. Our gifts, our possessions, our prayers, our obsessions, we're simply asked to bring them to the one who is king over all things, including our things. Finally, this passage reads us in the person of King Herod. King Herod is contrasted with the Magi in every possible way. Whereas the Magi are outsiders, King Herod is on the inside, professionally, politically, religiously. Herod fits neatly into all the preferred categories that we tend to aim for. As a religious authority and king, he has at his disposal the best biblical minds. He is connected with the most powerful political and professional allies. And yet, when God's Messiah is born, King Herod misses the mark. In fact, he misses the dartboard altogether. Herod has access to God's word in Scripture. He knows where to go. He knows where this king will be born. He knows all too well all of the things he needs to know, but the problem is is that Herod has also bought into a lie. It is a lie that we are all tempted with every day. And the lie is that we belong to ourselves, that we are our own personal kings. Or perhaps conversely, that others who have undue power over us, that unkind people more powerful than us are finally in charge. And so in the face of these lies, the birth of Jesus announces that there is a king over all people and all things, and it is Jesus. It's not any of us, regardless of what particular position or lack thereof. Herod sees Jesus as a threat to his power, to his plans. If Jesus is king, well, then Herod is not. Dale Bruner, commenting on this passage, puts it more pointedly. If Jesus is king, then we are not. None of us. And so Herod reads us, too. We who have ready access to God's word and scripture, we who have the means and opportunity to bring what we have, our power, our possessions, our opinions and plans on all matters of every kind, we have Herod's choice. Will we respond to what God tells us in scripture by laying these things down before the king of kings to put them at his disposal? Will we acknowledge that there is a good king in charge, a a charge not only of them, but also of us who have some measure of power and who has charged us to be stewards and shepherds that bear witness to that good power? Well, Herod chooses door number two. He chooses to hold tight to his power and plans, and behind door number two, Herod finds fear. Fear rather than joy. Fear is the fruit of Herod's response to Jesus. Fear that endangers not only Herod, but has deadly consequences for all of those under Herod's charge, as we learn later in this chapter. Herod reads us too. When faced with that choice, will we submit to Jesus as king, or will we keep that crown for ourselves? This Sunday, we're celebrating Epiphany. Epiphany signifies the appearance of God, which is precisely what we celebrate throughout Christmas. Jesus is Emmanuel. Jesus is God with us. His appearance is no secret. He has come. He is the King of Kings. There is no person or power in heaven or on earth that is not finally subject to that reign. And in light of this, Scripture's question for us is this, will we continue holding tight our own plans, our own power, or will we hold them 
loosely, allowing them to be directed at every turn by our Lord. Every day, Scripture reads us this way, will we choose to reap fear or will we choose to reap joy? Will we at every step follow God's leading? Will we allow those longings and restlessness planted deep in our hearts and our minds to lead us to Bethlehem? Will we pay attention to the voice of creation singing God's praises, pointing to their creator? Will we faithfully hear and obey God's voice in Scripture, following it again and again to that same place where it led Herod and the Magi to Jesus, the King of Kings? This new year, whatever your plans are, whatever your goals are, I hope that you will follow God's leading right here. Like those magi, led to joy again and again. Amen.